and so I'd now like to welcome to the stage uh, our distinguished um, uh, panellists. Uh, Per Frankelius um, from Linshoping uh, University is an associate professor there, I think I have that right. Um, Asa Volgart Broberg, um, Deputy Director of the Swedish Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation. Algis Gaishutis, uh, Chair of the Swedish European, uh, Swedish landowners, uh, the Lithuanian landowners organization. You see, I told you I would confuse you today, and I have done so. Uh, and St uh, Tiffany Stephanie, um, who is uh, Vice President at Yara, who will join online. Please come and join me on stage. You all sit there. I'll, I'll sit at the end here and, and try and coordinate our okay. discussion. Um, Per, I think you're going to lead us off with um, some reflections, both on what you heard from Tassos. Please, uh, I guess, uh, take yeah. a seat. Um, from what you heard from Tassos and also your own thoughts. So the uh, floor is yours. Uh, I actually have prepared some uh, slides for this uh, introduction. So if it's okay, I go for the slides. Absolutely. And, and uh, try ahead. to bring in the kind of uh, um, reflection into this discussion. So I go for slides uh, and uh, see what's happened. So please, um, uh, I think that we have discussed dilemmas today, or maybe not dilemmas. Maybe we can solve those dilemmas. At that farm, Rotenberg Manor, they are trying to develop a new combine harvester with airplane technology. Things are going on. And can we reach environmental and economic goals at, at the same time? I think we can. And if we look back, and we have done this in, in during today with some reflection. Look here. 4,200 minutes per ton in the 19th century, thanks to this technology. But now only two minutes per ton. This is what I call productivity. If we look at productivity in agriculture, uh, we, we had two and a half times better productivity now in relation to 1950. So, and this is fantastic, because no industry in the world have managed that kind of expansion. And it's thanks to the three-point linkage, Ferguson. It's thanks to mineral fertilizer and the spreading equipment, granulation. And thanks to hydraulics in a lot of machinery. So. We have seen it in animal care. We have seen a lot of innovation. And we managed to solve the food security that Malthus was so afraid of. Uh, we have seen progress in agriculture, which is far ahead of other industries. For example, robotics interacting with biological creatures. The problem we have discussed today and that we will discuss here in the debate, is we have new and extremely challenges. We have not only population growth, we have the ha new food habits in Asia that will demand a lot of feed production. And it will be at the cost of biological diversity if we don't find a solution. That is the problem. The problem also which we have discussed, we have so many other challenges. Uh, landowners are not secure in having their land anymore. Because politicians, municipalities want to create plastic furniture storehouses on the perfect land. So, above this, we have this disaster. And I think we have a sad situation. We, the Ukraine war is shaking us. So what we can discuss, what are the pathways? Shall we go back to tradition? Shall we try to imitate America, ourselves? Is imitation the solution? Or is it innovation? I think it's innovation. We see a lot of innovation. The, the, the plant, the technology for pl planting wheat, one example. 
sub-drip irrigation to, to secure water and fertilizer from underground. It's fantastic. I was in Israel. Some. This is from a, from a farm in Lithuania with methane engine and electric driveline. It's perfect. We can see solar uh, uh, concepts creating sustainable industries. And we can see sea and spray concepts pinpointing only the weeds, not the crop, only putting chemicals, bringing down chemicals to 90%. Bring it down. So, what I want to play into the discussion is if innovation is the solution, which I think, what factors affect innovation? I think there are four factors. We need developers, people who are engaged, trying to do things, like the guys here in Sweden who won the silver medal in Agritechnical Innovation Award for a compaction prevention system. That is not enough. We need users who are prepared to take in new ideas, implement them. But we also need institutions, organizations and policy that really promote innovation. And I want to say just some about that. Look at this. In Europe, we did uh, forbid DNA technology in agriculture. Is it good? Is it bad? Of course, it's bad. Because we stop technological innovation. I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a bit political here. But I think this is an example how regulation, strength, the innovation power cannot go forward. And if you look in history, you are landowners. In history, the Magna Carta in, in, in many, many hundred years ago, to be secure, to, to if you invest something, you need to be secure that you can get the money back. Otherwise, no one will invest. And we have a problem today with investments in innovation. You are not secure if you can have the return. And we should know that landowners in history really was one important factor that drove the industrial revolution because you need some powerful actors that can invest in technology. And we need to do this once again, but with a sustainability perspective. And I just want to point at the X factor. We are all the time taking in new X factors like the Ukraine war. So I think we need not only innovation, we need tradition and imitation, but we need much, much more innovation. And we are not investing in innovation enough. And we have not regulation system that promote innovation. So, I hope that we can change this. And by the way, agriculture is not a main emitter <coughs> of carbon dioxide, which United Nations say. We capture 11 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year through the photosynthesis. It's time to bring this up. Thank you. And I hope we can discuss some of this in this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Per, th thank you very much for that energetic and thought-provoking presentation. One question for you. Yanis said in his introduction that he, he applauded the innovation, but he said that it wasn't yet systemic. How do we make that innovation systemic and not niche? One example, if you promote innovation in, in producing uh, biodiesel, it's not easy. If the EU will not permit biodiesel pr crop production, you, you, you don't get the, the, uh, the money if you do this. So some innovation, is, they, they are good, but the, polit the policy, it's the same in the forestry. Mm. So if, if we want to solve problems, we need not only to focus on innovation, we need to, we need to focus on factors that affect innovation. Mm. So I agree with that perspective that we heard, that we need a holistic perspective mm. to, to look at how things are bound together. But we don't invest in this. We have in, in Sweden, we have uh, some million, we, we need billion in investments, in innovation. Mm. And we, why don't we have rob robotics? We have 50 robots on sale on the market. We cannot buy them because it's not allowed to have robots on, on, on the estates. It's insane. 
So we've, we've got a perspective there that, that, from your point of view, government plays a really enabling role. So, Asa, there's, there's a lot on your shoulders here. You're going to tell us about the, the national plan and how perhaps you might be responding to some of what pairs challenges. The floor is yours. Yeah, the cap plan, is that what you... Because yeah. I had some pictures yeah. as okay. well. Let's pass the, um, the clicker. There we go. Yeah, I was. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I was told to come here and talk to you about the Swedish uh, strategic plan of CAP. So uh, that's what I've been told. And I will just give you some short uh, notes about this uh, to start with, and then I will show you the whole plan. So please, the second picture. Uh, and I will try to address some, some of uh, what Per has told us. Uh, we are coming in this country from a, from, a, from a history of very high sanctions in CAP, from very burdensome administration. It has been a catastrophe, actually. So we had to move away from this situation and we have to find a new way of doing CAP in Sweden. So, in short, we have been working so hard for this, but I, for the Swedish landowners here, I can tell you that it is going to be simplified. Um, secondly, this is the topic for today. Um, we have to, the government has to facilitate for the farmers and the landowners to do the job with environment and climate. Uh, the government cannot do it itself. Uh, we have to be partners in this. And as you said in some paper that I read, the landowners and the farmers, you are the prime partners for the Swedish government to come to to get further in this environment and climate issues. So we really tried hard to find solutions on this. And thirdly, uh, another key principle of the strategic plan of, of Sweden is um, uh, we need to increase uh, a sustainable food, uh, food production. We need to increase here and we need to um, increase the investments. We need to pick up the young farmers to get them attracted to farming. And um, we also uh, have decided to focus on middle-sized farm instead of the very small farms, which, was, which is the normal approach from the commission. But we succeeded in discussing that in, in the circumstances of the Nordic countries, we need to also to put focus on the middle-sized farms. And in the Swedish context, this is 150 hectares. And finally, uh, knowledge and innovation, as you mentioned, this is one of the key principles for going forward, which has been acknowledged in the Swedish food strategy that we have had for about five, six years. But it is something for the future, and we put quite some money into this in the CAP strategic plan. So next slide, please. So this is... Uh, uh, yes, this is the, the CAP strategic plan. I'm not going to go through it, but uh, we have around 6 billion euros in, in it. 75% uh, is from the Union and 25% is from the Swedish government. Um, we have around 25% of the budget going to environment and climate. And we have a, a lot of different schemes, as you see in the green box, where the four first ones are uh, belonging to Pillar 1 and the other one to Pillar 2. Um, we have, many of these are existing already today, but we have raised payment levels, we've made them much more simple to engage farmers and landowners to really do the work here. Uh, and the right, uh, the blue field is food security, uh, of course, we have, have a lot of money for the income support, but we also have a couple support for bovine production, and investment support, and so on. And on the top uh, third, uh, we have the general objective of socioeconomic structure, where we have the support for young farmers, animal welfare, and um, 
uh, leader, for example. But what is special to find, finally, what is special with the Swedish CAP plan was what I uh, entered with. Uh, we cannot have this, this, the CAP plan what it is today. We had to do something, so we moved out quite some uh, interventions from CAP. We moved out nature restoration, we moved out carnivore protection, we moved out rural investment, climate investments, and so forth. We moved them into national support systems, so they are no longer in CAP, because it was too complicated for such a small country as Sweden is, after all. Uh, finally, the horizontal, yes, that's the circle in the middle, the innovation, knowledge exchange and cooperation. We put some effort in there too. And this is the Swedish CAP plan. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Just ask you a, f a follow-up question there you you mentioned four key drivers in the in the plan um to catch my eye obviously in the context of the discussion we've been having knowledge and innovation and and young farmers how how important do you regard that and and what are what are the, some of the specific steps that you're taking particularly in terms of the young farmers and engaging them in this uh, w w well, I think many many countries did this. You know, we have uh, extra payment uh, income for young farmers. They have a setup support. If you start a farm, you get uh, quite quite a lot of money, I think. Mm. Uh, and the third one is that if you do investments on the farm, you can get m a higher level payment than than older farmers. And old is forty here. <laughs> <laughs> I won't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> but we also entered the, the Young Farmers Union the f uh, into the monitoring committee of CAP. Mm. And, and then on the, on the knowledge and the innovation, um, maybe you can't comment on it, but how, how confident are you that, that, that what you have in there is going to drive new innovation in, in Sweden? And, and how much of it will you um, need to not import, but learn from others? And when I talk about innovation, I don't just mean technology, I mean in practices as well. Well, I'm just talking about the, the CAP budget. We do have EIP, I think most of you uh, have it in your countries. It's just a small share of what Sweden put it into innovation, actually. We also have a quite big program into f uh, food system mm -hmm. at the... Um, National Authority for Innovation. So, so they are doing the main work. The cap is just, just a little bit, I think. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. But they are doing a very good job, I say. Good. Maybe you're here. I don't know. <laughs> good. Um, I, I'm going to be as inclusive as I possibly can. I see um, Tiffany Stephanie um, on the screen in, in front of me from Yara. Um, Tiffany, I know you've been following um, the interventions of, of Yana's and uh, Ladislav and, and, and Tassos, and you've, you've heard the, um, the presentations here. From, from your perspective, um, Tiffany, do you think we can achieve these twin goals of food and environmental security um, in a way that works for farmers and landowners as, as well as for the planet? Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Mark and fellow panelists. And uh, my apologies for not being with you today. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I could unfortunately not travel to, uh, to Stockholm uh, for health reasons. But uh, to respond to your question, uh, Mark, I think um, we must uh, really uh, combine the need to grow more food and to tackle food insecurity in a more sustainable way. There's no other option, and we can do that. So I would really uh, um, uh, basically build on what the different uh, uh, colleagues and, and speakers have been saying so far. And I think, as Per, uh, per mentioned, uh, really innovation is the key, because ultimately um, there is no other way that we can also progress towards better practices and transform the agri-food system together. So if we look more closely into the CAP strategic plans and in the recent discussions about the uh, availability and affordability of fertilizers um, that has been uh, uh, picking up in Europe uh, in the last uh, uh, weeks and months, basically, um, there the situation has prompted the European Commission to come up with a communication on, on, on the topic. And this is actually a crucial step towards securing Europe's strategic autonomy in food and fertilizers, but it's also a crucial step 
to encourage uh, member states to better use the CAP strategic plans to address the fertilizer situation and also to improve the way uh, fertilizers and nutrients generally are, are spread on fields uh, to be more efficient and more sustainable because we can and must uh, solve the, the nutrient management uh, challenge if we want to meet uh, the uh, different uh, goals and ambitions that uh, the European Green Deal and that uh, the EU has committed in the different international for us. Um, and, and the reason why is because if we look into the current uh, context where the global food crisis is worsening, it is really essential that farmers in Europe make the most of every hectare and keep feeding their crops with the necessary nutrients. Um, this actually leads to a triple win if we work on a more efficient application of, uh, of nutrients, less greenhouse gas emissions, less nutrient runoffs, and so better protection for biodiversity and better economics for farmers. So the smarter farmer apply nutrients, the more money they save, and the less emissions they emit. Um, and this can put us basically also on the pathway towards the uh, ambition of the European uh, Farm to Fork strategy of halving nutrient losses. We have several solutions already available out there and, and uh, also touched upon this uh, on how to uh, basically improve nutrient management from looking at the right fertilizer and the right nutrient to agronomic advice or digital tools. If I look into uh, digital tools, we have a digital platform called AdFarm um, that helps farmers to uh, have what we call a variable rate application on their field. So really to give nutrients only on the different plots in the field where this is really needed and a bit less where this is less needed because maybe there are more nutrients in the soil. And this can help farmers to increase their yields by 6% and reduce fertilizer use by 12%. So indeed, maybe we've been a bit too confrontational on the, on the um, uh, twin transition of, uh, of, uh, of a better um, uh, environmental delivery of agriculture and also on the issue of ensuring food security. Because if farmers do this, um, with the example of the digital platform, they can actually have better crops uh, as a, and better harvests um, as a consequence. So the question really is um, um, that um, we know how to do this. Uh, at Yara, we've been looking into different field trials uh, across Europe, uh, from uh, the Nordic region to South Europe, and basically by using the best practices we know in terms of fertilizer use, and the digital solutions, European farmers can increase yields uh, and incomes by 5 to 7%, and at the same time reduce the nutrient losses by up to 20%. So the question is, what are we waiting for? Um, or even if I reformulate, um, how do we uh, break through of all these innovative approaches and tools? And that kind of links to what Per um, uh, and also Asa said about the, the Swedish uh, CAP plan. We really believe that the CAP strategic plans should be a vehicle to upscale best nutrient management practices, um, but also to support more innovation, such as the deployment of precision and, and digital farming tools. Also, Sweden has, I think, a very interesting approach on nutrient management. And if we look at the Swedish uh, CAP strategic plan, um, it includes, for instance, uh, to have uh, exactly this of encouraging farmers to use digital tools to have a precise amount of nutrients to be applied. Um, and this should be uh, covering about 1.4 million hectares annually in Sweden. So progress is there. And the question is really, how do we reach the next level? And there, I think we uh, really call on the European Commission uh, to encourage member states and also to member states themselves to really regularly adapt their CAP plans um, to include new measures. Uh, one key action, as I said, is to uh, ensure that there's a widespread use of precision and digital farming tools because this is key to make every nutrient count, what we need to do more than ever now. And it's also key to ensure the long-term soil fertility. In addition, this is also key to keep up with innovation and support, for instance, new approaches. And there I can't help but uh, look into the Swedish um, uh, uh, market more closely and uh, an initiative we have uh, uh, developed together with Lankmanen, one of the leading uh, agri cooperators, and I think colleagues are in the room, um, in Stockholm, uh, where together, Lantmanen and Yara, we've signed a first uh, commercial agreement to bring to the market next year um, green fertilizers. And what are green fertilizers? They are fertilizers which are produced with renewable energy instead of renewable gas, of, uh, of with natural gas. So basically, we can change the way we produce the fertilizers. We are doing this at Yara. 
and the future will happen now, next year in Sweden. But we need more of this. Uh, and the question is, how can, for instance, the CAP strategic plans, as they will be adapted, help to have this upscaling of the good practices and the innovations uh, such as this one? Because we must, at the same time, tackle the food crisis, solve the climate and nature emergency, um, as Jan has uh, particularly underlined, uh, and we need to transform the agri-food system. There's no other way that we do this in a coordinated manner, because this is a huge task. And I think here, the CAP strategic plans are really an essential vehicle, um, and we need to do that through collaboration and partnerships. Tiffany, thank you very much indeed for that. I'm going to come back to you in a second. With I just want you to consider this question. We, we often look to government in terms of what we need to do. I, I'd like you to think about what Yara and your partners would do to mm -hmm. go further and, and faster. What's, what's missing, or if you could have a, a, a one wish, what would it be um, to break through with those other partners? I'll come back to you on that in a second. Mm -hmm. um, Algus, I want to come to you now. I mean... Um, We've talked about the role of government. Pears given us a very thought-provoking um, intervention there. We've heard from Tiffany, one of the leading innovators in Europe. But you're the landowners. You're at the heart of this. Um, what, what do you need to be able to be economically viable as well as to deliver the food that we want and these environmental targets? Uh, very simple. Less bureaucracy and more competence when regulating uh, the sector, because uh, <laughs> I, I can just uh, raise a question. Does we have now with this strategic plans common agriculture policy in Europe? It's so huge variety in strategic plans, which every member country uh, does include in the, in the strategic plans. And it is uh, uh, act actually you in Sweden get rid of some activities from strategic plans regulated by commission and put on national funding. Our farmers in my country also are speaking that maybe we are not uh, going to participate in some activities. It is better to work on our own and to make a decision. So you have mentioned AUGA group, mm -hmm. which uh, do not use uh, EU funding, but invest in technologies which provide efficiency. And if we are speaking a little bit broader, uh, so what is needed uh, for our society? So it is needed a uh, secure, safe, and clean environment with affordable uh, food prices, which comes preferably from local sources, but not from abroad. And that it is a then question, uh, what uh, access to the market of local production that do we have? Because if you go to supermarket, uh, how much of Swedish uh, products or Lithuanian products you find in the supermarket? It is a difficult barrier to access this. We find uh, we feed all animals from soya from Brazil. And why from Brazil? Because they advance in technologies. They uh, know and they... Uh, yesterday, Alexander... Sorry for this name pronunciation. I know that it is not Portuguese, uh, <laughs> Brazilian. But they invest in the capturing of, of nitrogen technologies with, uh, Alexander, 17 billion in yeah, saving, saving in such technology, you need no fertilizers. And it is uh, not developed in the European Union. So really, we need competence and more freedom. And if uh, you allow me, uh, actually in many instances, uh, we as uh, landowners, forest owners, we see some of this blah blah sometimes is going so like a greenwash to, to support process but not support results. For instance, we are in Sweden and if uh, I am as a forest owner, I respect this country because uh, when you established first uh, the time a forest act in 1948, uh, I guess, yes. So it was a very clear message that the forestry should be mani managed for benefit. In my country, when the forest act was introduced, it was the uh, main idea, uh, manage forest to growing a big trees. Yeah, so it is a very different approach. So I think that uh, simply, we need more freedom and competence when uh, this uh, policy is formed. Mm. I, it would be unfair to put Asser on, to, on the spot here by asking for a Swedish response to that. So I'm, I'm going to go to Tassos, if you're still there. Tassos, we, 
We've talked um, in our recent podcast, I think, about this. Um, Argus talked about perhaps um, having plans in place that are, are more focused on process than on outcomes. It, is, is that true if you look back over the, the history of your career and, and perhaps where we're heading? And I'm not asking you to talk specifically about national strategic plans, just in general. Are we focused enough on the outcomes? Um, well, I was about to raise my hand on that because, you know, as you have said, I've been around quite some time. I don't remember when we had very high intervention prices, anybody saying, do we really have a common agricultural policy? One, we had the same intervention price across all member states, the then member states, but of course, the national prices were very different and not everybody used the same uh, intervention and everybody put uh, things on stock. So, what is extremely important is to keep in mind that when you have a combination of 27 member states, obviously there are going to be different structural differences among themselves, difference in the macroeconomic policy, the economic policy that also affects agriculture. And it is natural to have certain flexibility for them to implement what they have. So what is important is to we have basic common objectives and common policy measures that are the same. And yes, we continue to have them. Do we have more flexibility? And member states kept asking for that. We also have it. Does this apply in the same way um, as was designed? No, but we're living in a real world and we have to take into account that there is always a big difference between the proposal made by the Commission and what comes from the Council and the Parliament. And many times we tend to criticize the uh, regulation that is being implemented forgetting who made the changes that made this legislation more complex. And sometimes, you know, perfect is, uh, if you want, the worst enemy of the good. Uh, trying uh, to introduce, uh, to give you an example, and I'll stop there, eco schemes. When the Commission made the proposal, we allowed member states to focus on flexibility and to avoid focusing on the process, we said, we're going to measure performance. The end result of the political process was ring fencing of the budget. If you think that the ring fencing of the budget helped the process or the performance results? Uh, far be it from me to find myself in the middle of the Commission, the Parliament and the Member States. Um, so I'm going to look for the audience to, to dig me out of that particular hole. Um, we've got about 10 minutes of this session left. Questions to our panellists, uh, observations on anything that you heard from, from Yanas and others that you'd like to pick up on? My word, they must have filled you with such knowledge that all your <laughs> questions and prayers have been answered. So may, may I just uh, continue a bit? Uh, you absolutely can. Yeah, because I would like uh, to raise one topic uh, was was not uh, said, but in Rice Foundation, it was already developed about precision farming. So one solution it is really to uh, to introduce technologies, good technologies, and precision farming was less fertilizers, but more production. It is very important. I think that we should not overcome this uh, this possibility and to, to produce more from the same area as we really need. Uh, last month it was announced yes, that we have uh, 8 uh, billion people already in globe, and it is increasing, so we should Look how to supply us safe, healthy, and affordable food. Mm. Absolutely agree with that. I'm just going to come back to, to Tiffany then. Um, I assume she's still there. Tiffany, you can still hear us. I can hear you well, loud and clear. Very good. But back to that question then, um, mm -hmm. Tiffany, that, that I put to you a moment ago before we had the exchange with, with Argus. Um, We've talked again here on the platform about um, what governments can do to enable the, the systematization, let's say, that of innovation. But what are you, what are you doing with your industry partners and, and, and adjacent partners that will get the innovation that is needed by people like Algus to, 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 to achieve these targets, whether on the production side or indeed sustainability from an environmental perspective? Mm -hmm. I think we cannot sit back. Um, so basically, uh, what we do as Yara is uh, to work hard towards our ambition, which is to become climate neutral by 2050. 
Um, and to do that, we need to change the way we produce fertilizers and also uh, support farmers, enable farmers in, in further improving the way fertilizers are being used. If I look into the production side, basically what we are developing and implementing is a decarbonization roadmap play, plan by plan. Because basically, as I said, we use mainly natural gas as a feedstock. So we've been through this energy crisis actually for already more than a year. Um, but uh, this being said, we must uh, shift away from, from natural gas towards renewable energy. And so depending on where the plant is and, and, and its features, uh, we develop a dedicated decarbonization roadmap. So I gave the example of, of, of Sweden and the partnership with Landmannen. Uh, which is the result of the fact that we are electrifying one of our plants in Norway progressively. Um, there's another plant in the Netherlands where we are implementing a carbon capture and, and storage uh, uh, initiative, and many more are going to come or are coming and are in the pipeline for our more than uh, 12 plants um, in Europe. Um, so this is for the production side uh, that I would say basically we're spearheading the green transition because this is crucially what the world needs. Uh, uh, what the world needs, an energy transition, and we're doing our share. But um, this also, uh, also has to be supported by increased investments uh, in, in renewable energies and infrastructure across Europe. And then on the field side, I think what we are doing is to facilitate farmers' access uh, to, uh, to innovation and digital tools, such as uh, the digital platform I mentioned earlier, at Farm. So basically, um, even before the war, we already saw that both uh, energy prices uh, were increasing as well as uh, fertilizer price, uh, prices. So um, the affordability of fertilizers became an issue for farmers. And we thought uh, this is more than ever the need to support farmers to make every nutrient count. And a good way to do that is to facilitate the access to platforms like, like AdFarm, which help to have a, a variable rate application. Um, so basically precision farming and what we decided to do in the beginning of this year is to uh, remove the subscriptions um, the fees that were related to uh, using this platform so farmers in Europe can use it for free um, and we have seen a significant increase in the number of, uh, of, uh, of farmers across uh, Europe um, including Ukraine um, to, uh, to use this platform so these are small changes and we need to do more and last but not least, I think on the carbon sequestration uh, side, uh, we have joined forces with a couple of players, including the EIT Food, to develop the European Carbon Plus Coalition, which is really to uh, to go beyond uh, um, uh, uh, innovation by, um, as Tasso said, uh, fostering peer-to-peer -peer exchange, because it's uh, seeing is believing. And this is ultimately what the Carbon Plus Farming Coalition is aiming at uh, through different projects uh, um, across Europe to encourage farmers to have practices that help to regenerate the soils and sequester the carbon. So those would be some of the examples from our side. Great. Thank you, Tiffany. Esa. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to pick up some of what you said. And um, uh, we've had in, in this country, we have had an uh, advisory program for um, 25 years or at least 20 years on uh, nutrient management. And now, as, as uh, uh, Tiffany said, that we are adding this per uh, support for precision farming and we are expecting 75% of the farmers to align to this scheme in, in a few years. And when it comes to advisory program, around 60% of the farmers are in it. So I think there are steps t uh, that can be taken. And I think mo many farmers are satisfied that we, 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 we've done this effort. We're not, of course, at the end point, but, but there are things to do and it's possible. Mm. Do, do, you think we, um, do you think we invest enough in supporting farmers with the advice that they need from your perspective? Uh, well, it has. We can invest, but there are different, uh, different perspective. One is what the government can can afford. Uh, no, we can offer the farmers, but the other part is maybe the more more difficult one is. D d do the farmer or the landowner do do they believe that there is a need? Mm. And this is, I mean, this is a bigger issue. If you have a need, we can we can give you. Like, the support, the advice, or whatever you need. But if you don't feel that you do have a need, then it's it's harder to come through. Mm. So, Algus, it, it, do landowners, farmers, do they see the need? Do they do they feel that they are getting the advice and the knowledge transfer that they need 
to go further. Yeah, definitely it is needed and it's uh, very essential to be updated by newest knowledge, uh, technologies and uh, depending on size of farm because if it is uh, a professional and, and uh, the production is going in, in a bigger scale, so it is professional specialist working in firm and then, then they can increase uh, competence, qualifications and uh, they invest in quite a lot. For smaller family farmers uh, where family owns and, and the uh, continuous activities, uh, so it from case to case because how big uh, uh, size of farm and how active is it the uh, main uh, activity or it is just supplementary activity again uh, uh, so so we have also in our country very professional consultancy services provided but most important it is working uh, from the practical examples if neighbor as you told us uh, as others use already some knowledge it is much easier for others to accept this and i would like to touch one more thing about uh, young farmers uh, because it is a challenge but farming it is a style of life and if youngsters go to the big cities, educate and not only educate, but uh, linked to the, this urban uh, yeah. style of life. So it is very difficult even for prosperous yeah. uh, farmers to send invite back uh, yeah. to take over a farm. So it is yeah. also a challenge. And not only for Finland, when uh, from Lapland going to Helsinki, study some profession and do not know, or want to go back. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so it is also for us, for you, for others, so it is not only about including in some 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 councils or uh, working groups. It is uh, how to promote uh, countryside lifestyle. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that is very important. If, and if uh, young people feel that farming is respected, that it is not pollution, not polluters, not uh, those who harming environment, but those who are responsible for environment and which we as a landowners, forest owners, we would like uh, manage in a sustainable way just to give up uh, uh, to our child uh, uh, also this responsibility. That is very essential also for the long sustainable management for forestry and agriculture and it should be understood. Not all is this participation in the working groups and councils, everything, it is very essential to have competent people to represent and not, not, not be forgotten, but also to respect so those people who are working for countryside daily. For instance, if you have cows, they need to be milked at least twice per day. They need to be fed and to bring water to it. And it is no holidays for it. It is not a tractor or Mercedes when you put it to the garage and you forget uh, uh, for three months or for half a year. So it is its style of life. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So okay. it is also some advice needed and then some, some in involvement of people. I, I, I sometimes feel that we, we forget at the core of this. It is a lifestyle as well as a vocation. And um, it's important to remember. We're almost out of time. I do want to give Tassos the, the, the last word. But Per, I know you want to come in. And, and a question also then for you. You, you started with that very thought-provoking, energetic presentation. Sorry. Will you, lead the, will you leave the stage more optimistic or less optimistic that we can achieve our goals? Uh, um, uh, innovation needs uh, insight into the need, but also ability to pay for it. We have 500 euro too low wages in, in, in agriculture. Plus, you need to have a drive license. You, you are, you are uh, 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 smelling ammonia when you are coming home. It's, it's a risky job. So, and, and farming, they, they know all the technology. They are very skilled, but they need to invest. And innovation is the meeting between invention and someone who, who receive it. And we focus maybe too much or on development. We need to, to understand the, the, the system where we can bring it into, into use. I'm, I'm not very s satisfied with, with, with the situation. I, I cannot be positive. Sorry. Because problems, they are big. And I, I, I haven't seen a solution. Where is the solution? There are a lot of technology. Sea and spray concepts, the Yara concepts. 
we need to pay for it. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. So it, I'm sorry. It's back to, I think, what Yanis was saying right at the beginning. It has to be um, systemic and was what I was yeah. getting at with, with um, Tiffany in terms of how, how you integrate that innovation um, with other, uh, other elements that are needed in the system. But um, it, we don't have to leave the stage positive, but we do actually <laughs> at least have to leave, leave the stage understanding what, what the challenge is. And so that's my final question to you, Tassos. You talked about false dilemmas. Um, you recognize them, otherwise you wouldn't have put them on the slide. Do you think your former colleagues, and I mean that across the EU institutions, across the industry, the sector, do you think they recognize the false dilemmas and are we ready to do something about them? Yes, and whether we're ready to do something, let me do it in the form of an example. And an example that was mentioned before, which is precision farming. Because whether you move from a problem to a solution, you have to identify what you can do. Now, precision farming is to a very large extent about handling of a massive amount of data. And it's neutral with respect to the practice. You can be in organic farming, in, organic, in a conventional farming, precision farming is what helps you improve and do what we used to call in the past jointness and now it's called sustainable productivity. Where do we have a problem? The problem is on the debate about the privacy of the data. Now, we have to make a very clear distinction. The economic data of every farmer are sacred and they are protected. But when it comes to what is happening on land and land management, this is a data for the public good they're publicly available. And we have that paradox in the European Union that we have the most advanced publicly available satellite system in the world, which other parts of the world are using to improve their agricultural sector. And we have a hesitation in doing it for improving economic and environmental efficiency, but we have no problem in doing it for control purposes. Now, if we change the balance and the weight what we give on that, then we can move from you know, identifying problems into solutions and maybe we can change the balance between what is a more pessimistic and a more optimistic point of view. Perfect. What a great place to uh, to conclude um, the first sessions that we've had this morning. To um, to my panelists, um, Issa Volgast Broberg, Tiffany Stephanie Aldis Gashutis and um, per, per Frankelius, I thank you very much indeed for your contributions. You have stimulated our debate. I know that's going to continue uh, over coffee. Um, I can only thank you all again, and to you, Tassos, as always, our high appreciation. Please give them a warm well, round of applause.